Hey guys, we're going to go over the cards, some tips for playing the deck, different deck builds, and example gameplay. There are timestamps down below, so feel free to jump around to whatever sections you want to look at. Let's get right into it. We obviously have to start with the namesake card of the deck, Lair of Darkness. The field spell is what everything in the deck revolves around and why we can play some wonky cards that you don't normally see. Lair makes all face-up monsters dark, summons tokens to the turn player's board during the end phase, but most importantly, allows you to tribute one monster your opponent controls each turn. This works with just about any tributing cost other than ritual summoning or tribute summoning a monster. From the virus cards to silly stuff like Dark Hex Sealed Fusion, this is the main reason to play Lair of Darkness. We're going to get a little complicated right here at the beginning, but I want to explain the cost mechanics so you understand how it works moving forward and why this effect is so incredibly powerful. If we look at a card like Lilith Lady of Lament, we find its cost is tributing a monster and the effect is setting a trap from our deck. Whether it's tributing a monster, paying life points, or declaring a target, the cost always has to be paid up front when you activate the card. If we combine this cost-effect mechanic with Lair's tributing replacement, at any time we can choose to activate Lilith and pay the cost by tributing our opponent's most important monster. And there is nothing they can do about it since the cost has to be paid up front before the effect can resolve. That is why Lair of Darkness is a powerful card and why the entire deck is designed to synergize with it. Now let's go over the core cards of the deck. We'll start with Lilith and the other Ladies of Lament. Lilith is probably the best card in the deck besides Lair itself. As a quick effect, you can tribute a dark monster to set one of three traps from your deck. She's effectively a two-for-one that allows you to remove a monster and find the trap card you need to continue controlling your opponent out of the game. Malice is next, and I mean, look at that art though, right? Sheesh! She can tribute two monsters, including herself if need be, to reset a trap that is banished or in your graveyard. I usually only run the one copy of her since two tributes means we have to sack at least one of our cards, but she is good if the game goes long and you need to reuse some earlier cards from the game. Alice is probably the second best Lady of Lament since she can bring back Lilith from Grave if you normal summon her, and if she's tributed, you can search a Lady of Lament from deck, but if we're being honest, you're just gonna find another copy of Lilith as a backup. You can also banish a trap from hand or graveyard to special summon her. It doesn't come up very often, but it's good to know if you need two monsters on board to link summon. The last one is Loris. She can shuffle traps back to draw cards and reset a trap card from Grave. She can be good if the game goes really long, but I don't use her very often because usually if the game is going long, I've already managed to lock out my opponent and it's only a matter of time until we win. I would rather have another way to set up my game plan in that slot than counting on the game to go in my favor, if that makes sense. Next up is Arima, the good doggo. He is terraforming. You play two to three of him, depending on how many copies of Metaverse you want to run. He also has a tributing effect to stay in line with the whole lair theme. If he tributes himself, you draw a card, but if you tribute something else, you get to search your deck for a dark monster with 2,000 or more defense. The intended strategy is to tribute a lair token, search Diabolos, and immediately summon him because you tributed a monster that you control. However, there are a bunch of other relevant targets you can find, most notably Lord of the Heavenly Prison and all the Bestials fit this criteria. But we'll get to them soon. Diabolos is a really cool boss monster. He cannot be tributed or targeted by your opponent, so your opponent cannot kaiju or lava golem him, which is a really nice feature to have in a boss monster. Like I mentioned with Arima, he can summon himself from hand or grave if he sees you tribute one of your own monsters. You can use that summoning ability to swing for game out of nowhere by attacking with your monsters, tributing one with Lilith, and summoning him for an extra 3000 damage during the battle phase. He also has a tributing effect that functions as a kind of hand lock, forcing your opponent to either redraw a card from their hand, or put it on the bottom of their deck. But keep in mind, if your opponent doesn't have any cards in hand, you cannot use his ability. Metaverse! Recently put up to 3 at the cost of losing Eradicator to 1, 
Not exactly a trade I would have made, but oh well. Metaverse is really good for the deck because it's another way to secure our Lair of Darkness. Playing two or three is fine. I will say that having three copies of Lair, three copies of Arima, and three Metaverse should basically guarantee we get Lair, but it gets a little bricky. So we need to find that balance of making sure we get Lair on board while also not flooding out on cards to search it. I haven't bothered crafting a third copy since Trap Trick works fine to fill in that spot, and it saves you some ultra rare points since this deck is stupid expensive for some reason. But now that we've gone over the core cards, since Lair of Darkness is a control deck with a lot of freedom in how you build it, we're going to do something a little different. Dun 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 dun! Tier list! As we go through each of the different cards and engines, I'm going to rank how good I think they are. Now here's the obligatory, it's just my opinion. Feel free to leave a comment with what you think would be different. Um, so let's jump in. One of the first choices you need to make is deciding between Pot of Extravagance and Super Polymerization. Extravagance is amazing at fixing the deck's card advantage problem, while Super Poly offers you some crazy blowout potential. They are both very good and pretty self-explanatory. I'm going to put Pot of Extravagance in S tier and Super Poly in the top of A tier. It's just the discard really gets me sometimes. Um, otherwise, they're obviously both very good options. I will go over some deck build examples with both toward the end of the video. Or you could just skip there now if you want. That's fine too. Ties of the Brethren. Ties of the Brethren, Sangan, and believe it or not, Fusion Deployment. Ties is such a good card. If you have a level 3 Dark Fiend, which most of the monsters we run are, it special summons two more from the deck. Usually, you can get Lilith, Alice, and Sangan on board this way. Speaking of, let's talk about the creepy Tribble in the room. We can tribute Sangan with Lilith, get a trap search, and just about any hand trap we could want at the same time. I usually go for Ash Blossom for obvious reasons, DD Crow is another great choice, and you can also search Max C this way if you want to be really mean. If you're familiar with the channel, you know I don't like Maxi because I don't think any single card should be as meta-defining as it is. Also, probably more importantly, I just think it's really boring for content. Like, wow, you played Maxi and you won the game? Show me more of your incredible skills! <laughs> but obviously, if you want to play it, go right ahead. I also like Fusion Deployment when playing Ties of the Brethren. There is an old fusion monster called Sandwich who is a fusion of Sangan and Witch of the Black Forest, which is hilarious, and it lets us summon Sangan off of fusion deployment. How many sandwiches you play depends on what you're building. If you want Pot of Extravagance, then play three. If you want to go more for the Super Poly route, just play the one. Of course, if you aren't playing Ties, you probably don't need it. While I have really been liking Ties of the Brethren, it does feel really bad to top deck. Sometimes it will lose you the game, but I still think it's worth running at 3 just because of how good it is at setting up your board on turn 1. So because of that, I think I'm going to put it in A tier. Now like I said earlier, one of the biggest reasons to play Lair of Darkness is the ability to 2 for 1 your opponent. And the virus cards are some of the biggest blowouts you can play. You get to remove an important threat, delete a bunch of cards for the next three turns, and you get to know what cards your opponent has access to. These are heavily meta-dependent, except maybe Eradicator, which is almost always good. So let's start with that one. S tier. It's amazing. Better than Pot of Extravagance? Sure. I don't know. <laughs> it's definitely S tier. Eradicator is the best of the virus cards. By tributing a dark monster with 2500 or more attack, we destroy all spells or traps the opponent has and draws for the next three turns. Generally, calling spell is the best option since most decks run way more spells than traps, but if you find out you're up against Labyrinth, Eldritch, or any big trap-focused deck, you can still destroy your opponent's primary game plan. But I might as well mention this now, an important note for the viruses is it only checks cards your opponent draws. So if your opponent searches a card that matches the criteria that you called, it will not be destroyed because it was not drawn, it was added to their hand from their deck. Yes, Yu-Gi-Oh's rules are very silly and complicated. 
We used to play this card at 2 or even 3 because it's a reliable virus that provides a huge tempo swing as we're trying to establish control. It was limited to 1 recently, but it is still worth playing. It will just be a little less consistent. Deck Devastation Virus! There you are. This is the best alternative we have with Eradicator limited to 1. It gets rid of all of your opponent's hand traps and weaker monsters. It can also remove all the tokens that are summoned by Lair, but the vast majority of the time, you'll be summoning more to your opponent's board at the end of the turn after you use it, so that doesn't come up all that often. Of note, every main deck sprite monster gets hit by deck devastation. Some other noteworthy examples are all the low-level Fluunderies, almost every hand trap, and most of the Ad Emancipator cards. I'm gonna put deck devastation Probably in B tier. I might come back and change that. Uh, but next is Full Force Virus. I don't think Full Force is super good for the current meta. It destroys all monsters with 1500 or less defense. And it's kind of awkward because, for one, Link monsters don't have defense. So you would think it would be counted as zero, but it's actually counted more like Xyz monsters are with ranks versus levels, so they're just unaffected by the card, which I also think is silly, but Full Force doesn't hit any hand traps because most of them have 1800 defense, and a lot of the monsters we're seeing, at least right now, have more than 1500 defense, or if they don't, they aren't vital to their game plan. So definitely meta dependent, I don't think it's great right now. I'd probably put it in C or D tier. I'm gonna put it in C tier and then maybe come back to it later. Grinning Grave Virus. Man, I'm not sure what to say about this card. I don't think it's very good, but it does have some interesting applications if you wanna play it. So let's go over the, the good and the bad of this card, okay? The good is it destroys all monsters your opponent draws for the next three turns. And any monsters it sends to the graveyard cannot activate their effects, at least for that turn. So that is a very good effect. The downside is your opponent gets to send up to five cards from their deck to the graveyard. And while they won't be able to use those effects that turn, if they send cards like spells or traps that have a banishing effect, they will be able to use those on following turns. So you're kind of just beating your opponent card advantage. That's kind of why I think it's really bad. Um, the, the thing that gets me about it is the card could work. It just probably won't. So I'm going to put it in D tier. There is one last virus to talk about, and it goes with Fang of Critias. <laughs> Okay. Crush card, Mirror Force, and maybe Ring of Destruction if you want to go with the full theme. Uh, Crush card Virus has been errated four times now, I think. While not nearly as good as it was back in the day, it can still wipe out your opponent's hand and board. However, there are two major downsides to using Crush card. First, you can't deal damage for a full turn cycle, and your opponent gets to destroy three monsters in their deck and send them to the graveyard. You're basically giving your opponent three foolish burials. Technically better, since being destroyed can activate monster effects uh, like Tear Laments or Baby Dinos, for example. But the reason you play it is Doom Virus Dragon. Doom Virus has the original Crush Card effect before all of the erratas, and it is incredible. The dream is obviously to destroy your opponent's entire hand and force a surrender, but even if you only eliminate a couple of cards, you still get the knowledge of what options your opponent has. Now for the downsides, it is a monster, so it can be hit with uh, Imperm or other monster negation, and I don't think the meta is very good for it right now. Tier Laments is still the best deck in the game, at least as of recording, and sending their monsters to the graveyard just to activate their effects really isn't good. But if you're not playing against much tier or don't care about that matchup, Fang of Critias can be a really fun package to run. I'm gonna put Crush Card, oh man, probably D tier. Fang of Critias, C, Critias, C for Critias, sure. 
Uh, Mirror Force is next. Mirror Force is low-key good. I'm not saying it's S tier or anything, but nobody expects Mirror Force anymore. People will attack into you and give a chance for a huge tempo swing. It's best when used as a surprise card, but even if you reveal Mirror Force with Lilith, it turns into a mind game. Is that set card Mirror Force? Is it Impermanence? Is it a Virus or Ballista Squad? Suddenly they have to think it might not be safe to attack, and that alone can give you extra time to get back into the game. Mirror Force Dragon is also a really fun card, because it's great against people who don't read the whole text box, which I would argue is most players, to be honest. If any of your monsters are targeted for an attack, Mirror Force Dragon can blow up your opponent's entire board. Yes any of your monsters targeted for an attack. But anyway, I would put Mirror Force in B tier. I honestly think it's that good. Um, just, it can really steal games out of nowhere and your opponent just doesn't expect it. Uh, lastly, you can play Ring of Destruction and Destruction Dragon if you wanna go for the full theme, but Ring of Destruction doesn't fit super well. Life points tend to be more scarce for this deck since we often take damage while setting up our control plan. So I'm going to put Ring of Destruction, probably still better than Grinning Grave Virus, honestly. So next up is Bestials. Bestials are just strong in general, uh, but they can also be searched with a Rima, like I mentioned earlier. I mainly just play one Magnum Hut and one Druus Worm, maybe a Bald Drake if you want. In theory, you can tribute an opponent's monster and banish another one, but I find it doesn't work out like that in practice. Usually, you can get him down, but you'll have to tribute one of your own monsters in order to use him, and if you don't, then your opponent has a chance to set up interaction beforehand. Uh, there also isn't a short supply of ways for us to tribute our opponent's monsters, so an extra one isn't bad, it also just isn't really necessary. But I would definitely put the Bestials probably up in S tier. They just work really well with the deck, especially if you go Ties of the Brethren, it can just banish your Sangan and then set up for Druus Worm. The next engine we're gonna talk about is Artifacts. There they are. Artifacts consists of Artifact Sanctum, Scythe, and maybe Moral Talk. At the time of recording, Scythe is not banned in Master Duel. So if we can prevent our opponent from getting into the extra deck for a full turn, we can usually set up our control game and eventually win. Artifacts are an expensive but strong engine that you can run. The issue is that both Sanctum and Scythe are ultra rares, and we don't know if Konami will end up banning Scythe or not. It's probably worth banning, but it is an ultra rare and Konami doesn't like giving out free ultra rare points for the disenchant. You can play 2 to 3 Sanctum depending on how much you want to see it, and 2 Scythe is probably the right number just to keep it consistent. I kind of go back and forth between putting artifacts in the bottom of A or the top of B. I think I'm going to settle for the top of B just because Artifact Sanctum can be Ash Blossomed. So I'm going to leave artifacts here, but Scythe's ability is really significant if you can pull it off and will probably set you up to win the game. Labyrinth! You can play a small Labyrinth package if you want. The new Lady Labyrinth is a strong card that could set Eradicator from your deck. You can also get a little janky and play Labyrinth Barrage with Eradicator to copy its effect and destroy both spells and traps for the next three turns. Not super consistent, especially after the Eradicator limit, but it is really funny when it works. The problem I run into with Labyrinth is the archetype has its own busted field spell, so running it with Lair is a bit of a non-bow to me. Playing Labyrinth stuff in Lair almost feels like I'm watering down both archetypes. If you want to play Labyrinth, just play full power Labyrinth. I would rather play Lair, it certainly isn't as strong in the meta, but it is more unique and more fun to me. I'm going to put Labyrinth in B tier, just because as an engine it's a little awkward to run with Lair of Darkness. But next is Tour Guide! Tour Guide is a really good option. It is extremely good at baiting interaction like Ash Blossom or Imperm so that you can get off your Ties of Brethren play. And it's a one card Verte Anaconda if you're playing Super Poly and if Super Poly is still legal when you're watching this. Master Duel's ban list is so weird, you guys. I usually play at least one, if not more, depending on the build. So here's some trivia to keep things interesting. The monster Tour Guide summons is negated but Lilith can still use her cost to tribute a monster. What happens when a negated Lilith tributes herself? A. 
She's in the graveyard now, so her effect works. B. She was negated, so her effect fizzles. Or C. I couldn't think of another choice. The correct answer is... B. She was negated, so her effect fizzles. Because the monster was negated on the field, and that's where the effect was activated, regardless of where the card is now, the effect is negated. On the flip side, if Tour Guide summons Sangan and it gets sent to the graveyard, Sangan's effect activates in the graveyard so it won't be negated. Man, Yu Gi Oh is crazy. I think I'd put Tour Guide in A tier, maybe even S tier, honestly. I'm gonna leave it in A tier. Next up is Lord of the Heavenly Prison. I really like this card. I don't think you have to play it, but it fills a lot of roles for the deck. It protects your set traps, it has 3000 attack and defense so it can be tributed for the bigger viruses, and it even sets any spell or trap from your deck. With Eradicator at 1, I often use Heavenly Prison to set up these big Eradicator plays and then tribute him off when it gets back to my turn. Eradicator is probably the best target to set, but Metaverse and Super Poly are also great options. Just remember that if you don't use it, the card will banish itself at the end of your next turn. That's why Metaverse works out really well, because you can use it to set a permanent layer of darkness instead of setting a layer that will get removed at the end of that turn. Heavenly Prison I also think is an A tier card. Being able to set Eradicator right now is just really strong. Now we're going to go over some miscellaneous cards, uh, Ballista Squad, Back to the Front, and Heavy Storm Duster. All right. These are really great options for filling holes in your deck if you find you aren't quite at 40 cards. Ballista Squad is a consistent 2 for 1, and you can use it as a pseudo negate against continuous spells, traps, and field spells since they need to be on the field to resolve. Ballista Squad I used to think wasn't very good, but honestly I was just wrong. It's, re it's really good, I'm gonna put it in A tier. You might think Back to the Front would be bad with Bistials being so common, but it's actually great for that same reason. If you have a dark monster in Grave like Lilith, your opponent wants to banish it. So if you just wait for your opponent to try something, then you can activate it in response, fizzle their Bistial summon, and get back your Lilith all at once. Back to the Front is also definitely an A tier card. Heavy Storm Duster is pretty self-explanatory. Destroy two spell traps, it's good. I'm going to put it in B tier because Master Duel is a best of one. It's great against some decks and does nothing against others. It's a really great side deck card for best of three formats. You can't battle the turn you use it, but use it on your opponent's turn or don't battle. We miss the battle phase all the time with Ties of the Brethren, and it's really fine. It's way more important to establish control first, then we can slowly chip away at their life points later. Infinite Impermanence! It's a staple. It can be searched with Lilith and recycled with Malice. I mean, it's S tier. It should be pretty self-explanatory. Enemy Controller! Actually really good. It can set up some pretty sweet two or even three for ones by tributing an opponent's monster, stealing another monster, and then you can tribute it off before the end of the turn. Being a quick play is also really nice because you can activate it during your main phase, but it is not a trap, so it's not searchable by Lilith like the rest of our trap cards. Enemy Controller might be A tier, honestly. If you're going second, Enemy Controller can be a really great way to break boards, but it's also not very good on your opponent's turn, so I think I'm going to put it in B tier. Trap Trick! This card is good and bad. On one hand, you can grab almost any trap you want from your deck, but you can only activate one more trap that turn. This can put you in an awkward spot when you need to use Trap Trick to grab Metaverse for Lair of Darkness, but you also need another trap for interaction. I usually play one because I don't want to spend another 30 Ultra Rare points on a third Metaverse. Dogmatica Punishment! Uh, Dogmatica Punishment and, by extension, Elder Entity Ince. Is that like a rave thing? Uh, it's a removal spell for one or two cards, depending on the situation. Low A, mid... B. Honestly, it's more consistent than the cards in B tier, so I think it deserves to be A. Skill Drain! I don't really like Floodgates, but the power creep in this game is so ridiculous that Skill Drain is not a bad idea. Since we can use Lilith's cost to remove monsters, it gets around monster effects being negated. Plus, her attack will actually go back to 2000, which, in a simplified board state, can be tough to get over. 
I think skill drain is... Ugh, I, I do not want to put it in S tier. Is it that good, though? It might be that good. Uh, I'm going to put it in A tier because it's my tier list, but it might deserve to be an S tier, to be honest. Now, before we get to the extra deck, I want to mention hand traps and some other cards that just let you play the game. The usual suspects are good in our deck, especially if you're running the Ties Sangan engine. DD Crow is another good choice, as it turns out that banishing cards in your opponent's grave is pretty good. Plus, it's only a super rare. Ghost Ogre is another option I've been liking for getting rid of the Bestial spell traps. I also really like Dark Ruler No More because we don't care about its downside at all. And if we can set up Lair, there are a lot of ways for us to break boards and set up control. So if we reorder the tier list, Skill Drain, just for my sanity's sake, we're gonna move down a little bit. Sides of the Brethren, Tour Guide. Uh, yeah, I'm happy with that. Again, let me know if you agree or disagree with the placements. But I am gonna pull a Spraggles here really quick before I move on to the extra deck. So, throw that up there, put that down there, Ring of Destruction, Size of the Brethren, Crush Card. Crush Card's gotta go up there, right? A tier, Pot of Extravagance, Skill Drain. Skill Drain, stupid. And like I was saying, Grinning Grave Virus and Crush Card, ridiculously strong cards. Everyone is sleeping on these cards. Crush Card honestly might need to be errated for a fifth time. Meanwhile, down here in the bottom, we have Eradicator and Skill Drain. Just not very good cards. Eradicator was limited to one, so it's nowhere near as good as it used to be. And of course, my boy Fang of Critias up here. A tier, one of the best ways to build the deck, hands down. Okay, now that we got everyone who skipped to the end of the tier list, now we can move on to, no, 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 no. That was uh, for another project. Anyway, Beat Cop. Beat Cop uh, is worth running. She does feel a little win more sometimes. The main reason you use her is to put a counter on Lair of Darkness to protect it from destruction. Of course, it does so by tributing, so you can tribute an opponent's monster as well, but it isn't a quick effect like Lilith. If you haven't already guessed, every single tributing card we could run gets compared to Lilith because she is just that good. I think I undervalue Beat Cop a little bit, just because she isn't as good on turn 1, but she has a great utility effect to help lock down the game even more. You can use tokens to Link Summon her, but remember you need two monsters with different names in order to use her effect. Muckraker from the Underworld. Muckraker came out pretty recently. It has two effects. You can protect your monsters from destruction by tributing a Fiend, and you can special summon a fiend from graveyard by discarding a card. The second effect is definitely more useful. It's another way that you can revive Lilith. She requires two effect monsters as material, so running Link Spider as a way to transform your tokens into Link material for her is a good idea. Dark the Dark Charmer. This card is sneaky good. I've seen a lot of people running the Dark Charmer because there are so many dark attribute decks that go really crazy. The best part for us is that we can use the tokens from Lair to just go into him like with Beat Cop. I find that I end up using Dark a little more often than Beat Cop just because we can take an important resource from our opponent and hit them in the face with it at the same time. It's actually the 8th most played card according to Master Duel Meta, and honestly I think it deserves the spot. Predaplant, Verte Anaconda. I am not going to talk about this guy very much because we all know it's busted. It is probably the best reason to run Link Spider because Verte requires effect monsters for material. If you're playing Super Poly, play it. If he's banned, then sneak it into your deck and gaslight your opponent into thinking it's actually the next ban list he'll be banned. The rest of the extra deck really goes to Super Poly targets, which should be pretty self-explanatory. Starving Venom, Tri-Fi, Dragospelia, Garura, and Mud Dragon. I will say that Garura is really good just for the extra draw you get when it dies. We can run out of cards in this deck, especially if you aren't playing Pot of Extravagance. That one extra card can really be the difference between winning or losing a game. If you want to get really janky, you can play fusion monsters from other archetypes just to beat people down with their own monster. Wake up your elemental hero would be particularly good because you can fuse away your opponent's entire board. 
I would probably scoop on the spot if that happened to me. Now let's move on to examples of deck builds. I mentioned this earlier, but when you're deck building, you kind of need to make a choice between Pot of Extravagance and Super Poly. Extravagance, again, really good at fixing the card advantage issue, while Super Poly lets you break boards and kind of blow out your opponent. If you find that your wallet just isn't big enough for all that money, I guess you could run both and a ton of copies of your Super Poly targets, but then you end up running out of space for the good Link monsters that we mentioned earlier. Now this build is Lair plus Extravagance. It's probably the best and most consistent way to play Lair of Darkness. Lair Super Poly is really great at making turn two easier and fusing away your opponent's entire board. Fang of Critias is my personal favorite because it was the first video that did really well on my channel, and I just think it's super fun. Again, these are just examples of ways you could build your Lair deck. I think Lair is really easy to customize because the core package doesn't take up that much space, and you can mix and match to fit your playstyle. Shout out to Lair of Dankness on Twitter. They made a post a while back now with one of their deck builds, which is where I got the idea to play Ties of the Brethren. So. Their link is in the description. Now since Lair of Darkness is a control deck, there aren't any combos like there are for other decks. I mentioned stuff like Tributing during the battle phase for more damage off of Diabolos, and Ties of the Brethren for Sangan to search a hand trap, but that's kind of it. Instead, I'm going to show off a pretty sweet game and walk you through my thought process while I was playing. We are playing the Fang of Critias build, and this is a pretty weird start. I just set our cards, activate Heavenly Prison, and pass. If you do have both Heavenly Prisons in hand, you can hover over the card and there's actually a little mark that shows if a card is revealed, so you don't end up summoning the wrong monster, which I have totally done before. Our opponent is playing 60 card zombies and they have the full theme going. They fuse for Dragon Necro and search for some Vendred stuff. This fusion is pretty cool for zombies because it can summon tokens and is a great super poly option with Zombie World. Unfortunately, it does not destroy Alice, which means we can't search for Lilith. So at the end of their turn, I use super poly and fuse for Dragostopelia to set up some monster negation. And since a face down card was activated, we can summon Heavenly Prison and set a card. So of course, I'm going to pick Eradicator. They have three spells on board, so it's already a three for one or three for two, I guess, since I don't have Lair yet, which there is an argument for setting Metaverse just to get into Lair of Darkness, but Eradicator is too good not to get most of the time. We draw a Crush card, which is not great, but that's fine. Swing in, and it's a Glow Up Bloom, so they get to search Doom King, which could be a problem, but it is a problem for later. Now, Eradicator is going to banish itself if we don't use it, so I go ahead and Tribute Heavenly Prison and wipe their field. Then we see a crazy card, Scar of the Vendred. Whenever a monster on board is tributed, he can banish a zombie from grave to summon himself, and when he's sent to the graveyard, our opponent can search a Vendred card. So, given that our entire strategy is focused on tributing monsters, this guy is going to keep coming back and keep generating our opponent card advantage. But at least we know what our opponent is working with. They pull a Shooten Doji off the top, which I choose to negate. It would put a Banish Zombie on top of the deck, which I probably should have waited, but I forgot about the Link 2 Vendred. And they generate so much advantage here. They pitch Doom King to the graveyard, and to top it all off, they can attack over Dragostopelia. They also attack again, probably thinking they could swing over it with their effect, but Alice doesn't have any attack, and they pass turn. Okay. I really want to save my interaction for as long as I can, plus I might draw into Fang of Critias, which would be a huge game changer with Mirror Force Dragon. Our opponent tries to summon Doom King, but luckily they're limited to only Vendred monsters right now, and they get rid of Alice, which is kind of helpful, so we can search Lilith, and of course Scar comes back too. We can use Arima to grab Lair, so we can start getting set up. I tribute the Link Monster, and I pick two back to the fronts and one Imperm, because summoning Arima would let us tribute an opponent's monster and search Bestials, which would be amazing to banish that Scar, but of course we end up with Imperm instead. We try to knock out the token, but they use Al Ghul Mazera to protect it, so we just summon a token and pass turn. Now they draw another Revenants, which we know they have two in hand, along with a copy of Hound Horde. So not too scary at least. 
they go for their second savior and get to search again. I do not want them to bury more zombies, so I just pull the trigger on Lilith right away and remove the savior. Still trying to get back to the front, and we get it this time. Scar comes back once again, and they are setting up for a ritual summon. So I decide to use Crush Card here. I know they'll be able to summon Revenants when we destroy it with Crush Card, but I would rather deal with the one monster than two bigger ones. Crush Card is a decent two for one here, but they get to bury an Eldlich, which is another problem I will probably need to deal with at some point. But right now, they use Mizuki, which they buried off Crush Card as well, to summon Ballardrock. Ballard... Ballardrosh. Sure. So, maybe I should not have bothered using Crush Card, but oh well. They go all in here trying to banish Lair, but we can use Imperm to keep it on board. And Mirror Force comes in clutch here, and gets rid of all the work they just did. They can bring out Vendred Core, but this game was played right before the Imperm animation went live and they end up making a mistake and placing their ritual spell in the Imperm column. I don't really blame them at all because a lot has happened in this game. They had to banish their Hound Horde as well, so they wouldn't have been able to banish our lair with its effect, but either way, it's a rough misplay. I'm glad we have the animation now so stuff like this doesn't happen anymore. They pass turn and we summon a laughable amount of tokens. I should have activated back to the front to revive Arima at the end of the turn, but we just end up doing it on our turn. Tribute summon something and search Magnum Hut. That tribute is going to trigger Scar again, but we can banish it with the bestial we just searched, swing over some cards, grab Druus Worm, and we can keep our response settings on so we can tribute a token with Lilith and set up another trap before passing turn. We finally get a hit on Eradicator at just the worst time for our opponent because they are out of options. Doom King activates, but we can just banish it. They summon Eldlich, but we can just tribute it and Mirror Force again for good measure. Then they scoop it up. That was a really fun back and forth game, so GG's to the opponent. That is gonna do it. If you made it this far, bro, leave a like. Like, what are you doing? I know there's a lot here, but you're a smart guy. Whatever you do, I know you're gonna kill it, man. If you want more Lair content, I have a lot of videos on the channel, and it's one of those decks I keep coming back to because the games feel more interesting. You aren't just negating everything your opponent does, you have to pick your moments and really work to establish control. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments and I will do my best to answer. Anyway, I hope you have a great day and I will see you in the next one.